Well, uh, good to see you back. Um, they say that a nutritious lunch is able to make you doze, so I'm going to try to prevent that. Well, I had some great discussions during the lunchtime, and one of the discussions centered around discipleship. How do you kickstart discipleship? How do you get discipleship moving? And uh, of course, this is my first love, discipleship. I even do it ahead of po apologetics. <clears throat> one of the ways to begin discipleship is to consciously, intentionally, deliberately turn your friendships into spiritual growth buddyships. If you can take your friendships and actually vocalize to your friend, hey, let's make our friendship a context for discipleship, for spiritual maturity, for growth. It's because a lot of discipleship is not really formal. It's informal. A tremendous amount of ministry takes place just when friends get together, if they're deliberate, if they're intentional. And that's what this book is about. It's the one I have left the most of out there. And uh, <laughs> so, all right, someone saw through that back there. But... Uh, how many, just out of curiosity, how many have read the book, The Trellis on the Vine? Okay, would you guys rate that book for me? Is that like up there? Okay, two thumbs up from Michael. That's pretty good. So a lot of this book condenses Trellis on the Vine and uh, several other works on discipleship, including some works by uh, some great old divines from Scotland and so on. So uh, this is a book about the b biblical doctrine of discipleship and what it looks like in action. So uh, check it out before I take off. How's that? Well, our last uh, session is a, actually a summary of everything we've said so far. In fact, uh, the fact that uh, <clears throat> Pastor Tony and uh, Pastor Scott uh, settled on this topic, I actually gave them a choice of 16 topics, and they chose the five that I did this weekend. And so... They chose this one as the closing subject, and it was really a wise choice because this whole idea of neutrality, we have to expose that as a myth. Now, part of this talk today is getting your mind right. It's not about telling the unbeliever, hey, there's no neutral ground. This is about getting your own mind right before you go out and share your faith. Exposing the myth of neutrality, unbelievers sooner or later will pressure you to start in some neutral zone. Can't we talk about this with your Bible closed? I want to talk about this, they're saying, without introducing religion. Now, this happened to me the other day on a, on a community college campus just a few weeks ago. Uh, about an hour into the discussion, about a half an hour into the discussion, the student said, oh, I'm not ready for you to bring in religion yet. But it's the same individual who would not answer questions one and two. Where do we come from? Why do we have dignity? He refused to answer those two. He just couldn't wait to tell me how excited he was that the world's problems can be solved by socialism. He just couldn't wait to tell me that. So he goes, let's go straight to questions three and four. What's gone wrong with the world? We've got an unequal amount of money distributed. What can you do to fix it? Equalize the amount of money distributed. Of course, I brought up the communist experiment, and uh, he dismissed that as not the right form of socialism. <clears throat> So, under uh, letter A in your outline, Christian scholarship is frequently pressured to put aside commitments that are distinctly Christian. And they want you to do this in the interest of neutrality. Can't we begin at a neutral place? Since you're already quite dug in to your Christian beliefs, can't we begin in a neutral place? Wouldn't that be more fair? Sometimes I use this example. Is it true in science that if you're not depending on something for your reputation or for your prosperity or for something else, you'll be more objective in studying it. Yes. How about oxygen? Kind of dependent on that. Can we really study oxygen as a detached observer? No, because you would die quite quickly. How much more do you need God than oxygen? A lot more. He made it. So sometimes when I start with this whole topic, I'll bring up some simple examples like that. Another one I bring up is this. <clears throat> if I gave you a notepad, a 12-inch ruler, and a stubby pencil, and said, I'll give you a billion dollars if you can map the Himalayas, why would you fail? Radically inadequate equipment. You're going to actually mark off the Himalayas with a 12-inch ruler? <clears throat> 
Well, the God who made the Himalayas, you cannot find him the way you look in the cupboard to see if the crackers are there. God is transcendent. He's known through his fingerprints in creation and conscience. He's known through his word. He's known through his son. He's known through the gospel. The reason you can't find him is because you're looking for him as if he is not transcendent. You're looking for him as if he's part of the creation. He claims to not be part of the creation. So when an unbeliever says, well, I'm looking for God, I can't find him, I say that's like looking for the sun by lighting a candle. That's an absurd statement, isn't it? But that's what it's like seeking for God if you start with self. So <clears throat> the pressure put on us to be neutral in the discussion is actually a, a secular way of thinking that neutrality is possible. And so the whole point of my talk, this last talk, is that neutrality is not, poss not possible when it comes to the truth claims of God Almighty. Uh, Roman numeral two, the, the, nature of the, the nature of reason makes neutrality impossible. The nature of reason makes neutrality impossible. Why is that? Look at letter A, because facts are inseparable from their interpretation. They cannot stand alone. Now, how many here teach science or biology or life science? Anybody? One? Anybody else? Okay, well, how many of you know what an ammonite is, a fossil ammonite? I'm holding a fossil ammonite in my hand. It's actually a, a snail. Scientists would say it's a prehistoric snail, but I believe that uh, Noah could see these in shallow seas. And this uh, is a fossil ammonite, and if you're an evolutionist, they'd say, wow, you're holding something over 30 million years old. But I believe this was uh, quickly fossilized in the Genesis flood. That's just one illustration of facts are inseparable from their interpretation because there's a system of thought and interpretation which we always depend upon when we gather facts or link them together. Without a system of interpretation, it's like trying to string beads with no string and no holes drilled in the beads. You can't put them on anything. What's a simpler one to remember? Facts are like gravy, they run, all over the they run all over the place unless you have a mashed potato shape to put them in and pour them in. Facts just run all over the place. They need a system of interpretation. So if, you, if the unbeliever ever says to you, facts speak for themselves, tell him, no they don't, because I saw Pastor Jay hold up an Ammonite. <laughs> <laughs> all right, letter B. Neutrality is impossible because facts and evidences are interpreted by means of one's worldview. Sooner or later, we find out that the, the debate is not really over the meaning of facts, but over the worldview behind your interpretation. And where does your worldview come from? Heart commitment about your epistemology. Your heart commitment about where certain knowledge is found is your worldview. And that's going to govern how you gather facts, whether you, whether you think something is a fact, how you correlate facts and how you conclude from facts comes from your worldview. And this is vital that we know this because the believer and the unbeliever are in total disagreement about the structure of reality. It's about like two people standing on opposite rims of the Grand Canyon, yelling across, hoping to make sense to the other person at the widest point in the Grand Canyon. There'll be no communication. So reason, your human intellect, is not an abstract, neutral faculty. Your powers of reasoning were planted in you by God so that you could receive his revelation. When I was uh, teaching my little daughter about the Bible <clears throat> before she grew up and moved away, I said, honey, let's think about Adam he was one hour old when he had the ability to name all the animals and pick names which matched their characteristics, their behavior, and their anatomy. Where did, that, where did that information come from? Think of the incredible download into Adam's mind he must have had when God stood him up on his feet and breathed, breathed the breath of life into him. 
Not only did he recognize how to name each of the animals, he recognized what to say to a beautiful woman when God presented Eve to himself. No one was there but the Lord. He officiated the wedding, and it was a real wedding in every sense of the word. And Adam said, Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, you shall be called a woman, for you were taken from man. You're the mother of all the living, Eve. What a precious thing, because the church of Christ is taken from the side of Christ in his wounds, and the first woman who pictures the bride of Christ is taken from the side of Adam. What an incredible account this is in Genesis. So God put understanding in the innermost being, Job 38, 36, and in putting understanding in us, reason is not a neutral faculty. God put it there so we could receive his revelation and know what to believe and how to live and how to worship our maker. But your unbelieving friend treats powers of reasoning as an independent faculty that is morally neutral. So one of the things I establish in sharing the gospel is that truth claims are never ethically neutral. Truth claims are highly ethical because behind every truth stands God's authority. Truth is not floating out there like cumulus clouds. Truth is anchored in God's description of the world and his sustaining of it. In fact, the laws that uphold our creation are not independent. God is exerting immense power every moment, sustaining all things. Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. So uh, take a look in your Bibles at John 7, 17. Christ gives a truth criterion totally related to ethics in John 7, 17. And I love to use this verse with my skeptical friends. John 7, 17. If any man is willing to do his will, that's the Father's will, he shall know of my teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. My friends, this is our Christian epistemology. Truth has an ethical foundation. I can actually say to my unbelieving friend, the reason you don't bow before Christ as Lord of the cosmos and Lord of your life is because you don't recognize his lordship. And the reason you don't recognize his lordship is because you're unwilling to do the will of the Father. <laughs> you see the ethical connection there. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and I will say to them, I never knew you. For only those who do the will of the Father are going to heaven. And by the grace of God, he's enabled us to do his will and love his will through the spirit he's put in us. So this is profound. Truth has an ethical foundation. It's anchored in God's authority. And truth has an ethical criterion for its recognition, and that is a willingness to do the will of the Father. So when I'm talking to my unbelieving friend, I want him to know that his powers of reasoning were planted in him by God to receive divine revelation. But if it depended upon level of intellect and IQ, we'd certainly be in trouble for everybody in this room would be high IQ people because that's how you got saved, right? But not so. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 18, verse 3. Matthew 18, verse 3. And he said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted or turned and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that interesting? Your intellect must stoop low to enter through the gospel gate. You've got to admit, I am not the final source of reference and authority. I, my opinions, which I used to worship, were basically weapons formed against God himself. I've got to stoop low. I picture the door of Noah's ark. I think it had a big cargo door and all the animals went in the cargo door and people probably went up the ramp at the very last and it was a small door and they had to kind of duck down to get in. It involved great faith. Who in the world would build a boat in the middle of a jungle, way away from oceans? It would take a great deal of faith. They humbled themselves like little children, even to get in the ark. 
So how does, the, how does the unbeliever use his intellect or powers of reasoning? Take a look at Roman numeral three. The nature of the sinner makes neutrality impossible. And so when men uh, use their minds, uh, supposedly reasoning in a neutral fashion, it's characterized by a vain and darkened mind. I'm going to read to you Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. Ever wonder why, how can people justify a sexually immoral lifestyle? And I want you to see in this passage how closely tied together a false worldview is and sexual license. I want you to see how closely this is tied together. Verse 17, Ephesians 4, This I say therefore and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they have become callous, having given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. How can you use this passage? Say, God has x-rayed the hearts of us all and he's shown us that if we use our minds with an affinity for dark and futile understanding and futile reasoning, we will give ourselves over to immorality for we won't have any reasons not to if we reason that way. So you can actually show that to an unbeliever. I often do to university students who are justifying a lifestyle of licentiousness. I'll show them that this kind of reasoning is what they're doing to try to give permission to their lusts. They've chosen a worldview that frees up their lusts and Paul calls it darkened and futile reasoning. So, Satan promised Eve that if she ate that fruit, she'd create a new reality where she would be wise and divine and arbiter of truth, more independent. But one of the things we recognize in dealing with an unbeliever, no sin creates a new reality. That person is still in God's world and God, God's world works in God's way. Sin does not create a new reality in any sense of the word at all. So the unbeliever has an illusory worldview. It doesn't match reality. It's a fantasy worldview. It doesn't fit. Has anyone here read a book by David Wells? No Place for Truth, God in the Wasteland, What Happened to Morality, Christ in the Postmodern World. I just love David Wells' books. Unlike most... Um, People with multiple doctorates, they don't start Bible studies for unbelievers. But David Wells did. I heard him come to Westminster Seminary. I went to chapel that day. And he spoke about a Bible study for unbelievers. And we said, well, David, how did, Dr. Wells, how'd you do this? He says, well, I started putting in coffee shops all over southern New Hampshire. I started putting posters that said, do you feel betrayed, beat up, and broken by our culture's false promises? Come have coffee. We want to hear your story. For six months, he listened to people. I was promised if I did this, I changed my gender, I did this, if I had multiple partners. All they did was break me, depress me, and everything else. They just cried for six months. After six months, they said, well, you're a professor at a Christian seminary. What do you think the problem is? Bingo. That's a lot of patience, isn't it? At one point, he had 30 unbelievers who wanted to hear the gospel. And all of his Christian friends said, Dr. Wells, can we come to your study? He goes, no, you've got to be unsaved to come. <laughs> you can't crash this study. And as he began explaining the gospel to them and where human dignity comes from, and at the center of the universe is, is a love that conquers every sin and everything that separates us from God, and heals our hurts and our woundedness. It's all in Christ. As he begins sharing these things, they begin to come to saving faith in Christ. And one woman who'd had nine abortions came to saving faith. <clears throat> and when she recognized what a human being was, she named each of those babies. Purchased a headstone for each one. She wanted to retrieve the dignity that was lost in her false worldview. 
And so this is another approach we have. We actually talk to people about promises in our culture which is producing broken, hurt, and damaged people because it does not match reality. It does not match biblical worldview. It's going to break hearts. It's going to break people. Fragmented worldviews fragment people. We only have healing integration in our Savior. In Him we are whole. It says so in Colossians 2.10. In him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily, Colossians 2.9, and in him you have been made whole and complete, Colossians 2.10. So a neutral approach is condemned by Scripture because it does not begin with the truth of God. It begins with self. And we understand that the unbeliever is hostile to Christian living at every point. I'm in letter B under Roman numeral 3 in your outline, 3B. Unbeliever's worldview is hostile to the Christian philosophy of life at every single point. And so we need to tactfully communicate to the unbeliever that because of his heart commitments to sin, he cannot be neutral toward the truth claims of God. We cannot allow a neutral starting place because of that. Roman numeral four, the nature of God's revelation in Scripture makes neutrality impossible and so I like this bit of counsel if the unbeliever says hey let's start without your Bible around let's start in a neutral position what he's asking you to do is lay down your sword (laughs) he's actually saying I think I recognize something pretty scary about this book why don't you lay your sword down and we'll talk Don't do that. Don't relinquish your sword of truth. This is where the power is. I tell you, I've asked unbelievers to read a passage. I hand them this book. It's like they gotta be brushed off for radioactivity after they touch this. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna touch that book? This is terrifying. They know that the truth is in this book. So scripture authoritatively interprets the cosmos all things natural in the physical universe and interprets all things moral. In thy light we see light. Psalm 36, 9. This is why St. Augustine said, I believe in order that I may understand. I believe that I may understand. Because if we're trying to reason outside of God's light, we'll always come to futility. In thy light we see light. Let her see the word of God infallibly answers Every ultimate question, I know I've been hammering on that for the last four or five sessions. Each of these ultimate questions, why are we here, what's either evil, death, and suffering, what happens when you die, is God knowable? Each of these ultimate questions is answered authoritatively by Scripture. Therefore, when an unbeliever tries to reason about the nature of reality, he's going to make foolish conclusions, isn't he? All right, Roman numeral five, the nature of the debate makes neutrality impossible. What is the nature of the debate? The nature of the debate is how God sees the sinner, how God sees the unbeliever. And the nature of the debate has to be a point of contact challenge in which the unbeliever's imagined independence is put on trial. See, it says in John 16 that the Holy Spirit will be sent to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit is sent to gain a verdict in the conscience, to gain an actual verdict, a verdict about the sinner's dilemma, about his rebellion, about his state of truth suppression. The Spirit is sent to gain that. Letter B. Christians have a worldview in common with unbelievers, but not a worldview. I'm sorry, one more time. Christians have a world in common with unbelievers, but not a worldview in common with unbelievers. That's really profound, but needs to be explicated a bit. We have a world in common with unbelievers. Same creator. The fact we have a faculty called conscience. The fact that God has revealed himself in general and special revelation. We have a creator in common. We have a world in common and we have a divine image in common. That's a lot of common ground. And so the challenge I'm issuing to you in this last session is don't 
replace common ground with neutral ground. Not a single piece of ground is neutral, but all of ground is common ground. We've got everything in common except the worldview in common. We don't have that in common. Creator in common, a revelation in common, a world in common, and an image of God in common, but we do not have a worldview in common. Therefore, there cannot be neutral ground or we'll lose the point of contact. If we grant neutral ground to an unbeliever, all we do is delay his conviction of sin. So don't yield to that. All right, letter C. The Christian apologist cannot leave the unbeliever's controlling presupposition unchallenged. The unbeliever wants to believe he's the reference point. He's operating from that assumption. We cannot leave that unchallenged. We must not leave that unchallenged. And so Scripture emphasizes a strong contrast, an antithesis, a tension between light and darkness and between truth and error. So I think one of the ways to help summarize this is to emphasize that a man who accepts Christianity only because it fits his presuppositions and his self-made frame of reference, he will always pervert Christianity. We don't adapt Christianity to his neutral claims or his presuppositions or he will pervert Christianity. Now, one of my heroes in presuppositional apologetics is John Whitcomb. And John Whitcomb says, look at Paul preaching on Mars Hill. He says something very brief about proof. Take a look at Acts 17. He says something very, very brief about proof and then calls for repentance right away. Acts 17, verse 30. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. I think in today's world, they might have said, well, Paul, why didn't you circulate a clipboard among these Athenian philosophers and organize a trip to the Holy Land so they could look in the tomb and look at all the evidence and count it up and talk to Luke and everything else. Why didn't you organize an apologetics trip to the Holy Land? And I like John Whitcomb's statement. We bring the gospel to men unproven. Now, does that bother any of us? We bring the gospel to men unproven? It shouldn't. Man is not an unbiased, neutral truth seeker capable of sitting in judgment waiting to find out which is logically coherent, historically and scientifically factual and personally satisfying before adopting it as his own. On the contrary, from the biblical standpoint, sinful men have no right to demand proper credentials when the Creator says to them, repent, believe the gospel, obey me now. The gospel calls for an immediate response. I think this will help us in our apologetic. We bring the gospel to men unproven. And faith in the gospel does not require a whole stack of evidences and proofs external to Scripture. I don't mind if you use them. It might even weaken your case because it allows the unbeliever to sit in trial on God's word. It puts God in the box and the, and the, and the, uh, the unbeliever in the jury box. You have to be very careful about doing that, don't we? So... In Christ, man finds true wisdom and true knowledge that he lost in the fall. And uh, Christ is telling us in many places, such as John 5 and John 12, that the Word of God is self-attesting. Has anybody read the book by John Piper called A Peculiar Glory? A Peculiar Glory. Anybody? It's a book about Scripture's self-attestation that the moment an unbeliever comes in contact with Scripture, he is faced with God and there is trauma 
He's in a state of trauma, whether he admits it or not, because he's dealing with his own creator whose words are put into Scripture. And there's a peculiar glory, a magisterial glory about God's self-attesting word. It is adequate by itself. Nothing can sit in judgment on it. And so when you grant neutrality, you're basically saying, I invite you to sit in judgment on God's word. Brethren, there is no incremental movement from sitting in judgment on this book to having this book sit in judgment on you. It's one or the other. There's no incremental movements to slowly edge over into that region until it flip-flops. Oh yeah, okay, the word judges me. I'm no longer judging the word. There's no increments. It's all or nothing. That's why we don't give neutrality in a debate like this. We don't concede neutrality. So this is all designed to give us boldness, to give us confidence that the Lord has appointed us to be his ambassadors, his fishers of men. The Lord said, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather scatters. Ever wondered what it means? He who is not actively gathering souls with me is actually scattering souls from me. Wait a minute. What about lukewarm Christians? Wait a minute. What about fearful Christians? Wait a minute. What about backslidden Christians? He who is not gathering with me is scattering from me. I find this very convicting because if I'm apathetic about sharing the gospel, that apathy basically says to the unbeliever, no big deal, you're not in danger. Just do your best. We'll get around to it later. No, if I'm actively gathering with Christ, then I have the urgency of salvation on my mind and I want to put it on the minds of my unsaved friends. So important. We have to be careful that our apathy about this, our lethargy in this matter, doesn't make us those guilty of scattering from Christ because we've not confessed Him with the zeal we ought to have.